This lecture is going to cover one factor analysis of variance, or one factor ANOVA, as well as three different multiple comparisons techniques the Bonferroni approach, the Tukey Kramer method, and Chaffee's method of multiple comparisons. So let's take a look at what a one factor ANOVA problem might look like. Suppose we're comparing the mean final exam scores of four statistics classes to see if the students are performing similarly across the board. Let's number these sections 1, 2, 3, and 4. We'll take a random sample of 10 students from each class, and our goal here is to determine if the mean final exam scores are equal across the four classes. Now taking a look at the side-by-side -side box plot in the bottom right, it does seem as if the means are somewhat different from one another, but at the same time, we have to understand and realize that there is variability within each individual sample. There is some overlap across these four box plots. So what we need is an inferential technique that allows us to compare multiple levels of a categorical variable, the section of the class in this case, with no continuous predictors. One-factor analysis of variance, or one-factor ANOVA, is a statistical technique that we use to compare the means of three or more populations. One-factor ANOVA uses two different sources of variability, between group variability and within group variability, to compare the means. In one-factor ANOVA, the independent variable must be treated as categorical, and you're not going to have any quantitative predictors. We can also formulate this as a regression model. Now let's discuss the two different sources of variability. Between group variation is a measure of how much variability exists between the sample means of the individual groups. It looks to answer the question, how different are the sample means of each group compared to the grand mean? The grand mean is defined to be the overall mean of every single response that you have, ignoring the group that it was sampled from. The grand mean is denoted by Y double bar, and it's calculated by taking a weighted average of all of your individual sample means. We have the sample size from the first category times the sample mean response from that category, plus the sample size from the second group times the sample mean from that group, etc., all the way out through our final group N sub K times Y bar sub K. We divide that sum by N, where n is the total number of observations that we have across all of our groups. The other source of variability that we have is within group variation. Within group variation measures the amount of variability that exists within the individual samples themselves. So within group variation is looking to answer the question, how different are the individual observations from one another within each of our individual groups that we've sampled from? Take a look at these two sets of side-by-side -side box plots. The box plots at the top are exhibiting small between-group variation. The reason that we have small between-group variation here is because the means of these three groups are relatively close together. The mean of group A is about equal to 40, the mean of group B is equal to 42, and the mean of group C is around 44. These side-by-side -side box plots are also exhibiting large within-group variation. In each of these box plots, the observations within the individual groups are relatively far away from each other, with a range of about 40 in each of the individual groups. So the fact that we have small between-group variation and large within-group variation is giving us the impression that the means of these groups are not all that different from one another. We probably wouldn't find a significant difference in the group means. As for the side-by-side -side box plots down at the bottom, these are exhibiting large between-group variation because the means are pretty far apart. These three groups have means of about 3, 13, and 23. We also have small within-group variation in these box plots. The observations within each individual group are very close together, with a range of about 5 across the board. So here, by having large between-group variation and small within-group variation, this is an example of where we would probably find a significant difference in the means of these three groups. Setting up the regression model in one-factor ANOVA is slightly different from what we did back in multiple regression. 
On the left side of the equation, we still have y, the actual value of the response. But now on the right, we have mu replacing beta naught. Mu is going to represent the mean of the reference group, or the baseline category. Then we're going to add on alpha 1 times z1 plus alpha 2 times z2, all the way out through alpha sub k minus 1 times z sub k minus 1. Here, the alphas are replacing the betas as your regression parameters, and the z's are dummy variables that correspond to the group from which the observation was sampled. So what we'll say is that z sub i is going to be equal to 1 if the observation comes from group i, and it'll be equal to 0 if it comes from some other group. Group k is going to act as the reference group, so all of your dummy variables are going to be switched off if an observation was sampled from the reference group. The regression equation in one factor ANOVA is much easier to calculate out compared to multiple regression. On the left side, we have y hat, the predicted value of the response, and we set that equal to alpha not hat. Alpha not hat is always going to be equal to the sample mean of the reference group. Then we add on alpha 1 hat times z1 plus alpha 2 hat times z2, all the way out through alpha sub k minus 1 hat times z sub k minus 1. Each of the individual alphas can be calculated through a difference of sample means. So alpha sub i hat is going to be equal to y i bar minus y k bar, where y i bar is the sample mean of group i, and y k bar is just equal to the sample mean of the reference group. So let's go back to our example where we're comparing the mean final exam scores across four different statistics classes. In this case, because we have four different groups that we're comparing, we're going to need three dummy variables. So our regression model is going to be y equal to mu plus alpha 1 times z1 plus alpha 2 times z2 plus alpha 3 times z3 plus the error term. Here, we'll set z1 equal to 1 if the student sampled was from section 1 and 0 otherwise. We'll set z2 equal to 1 if the student came from section 2 and 0 otherwise. And we'll set z3 equal to 1 if the student came from section 3 and 0 otherwise. Notice here that the fourth section is going to act as our reference group, so we don't need a dummy variable for that group. The hypotheses in one factor ANOVA can actually be stated in two different ways. Let's say we have k different groups that we're comparing. One way that we can state the hypotheses is in the null hypothesis, say that mu1 is equal to mu2, is equal to mu3, all the way out through mu sub k. And the alternative would be that at least two of these means are not equal to one another. The other way that we can formulate the hypotheses is through the regression model. In the null hypothesis, we could say that all of our alphas are simultaneously equal to zero, which is saying that every single one of our groups can be estimated equally based on using the sample mean from the reference group. The alternative here would be that at least one of these alphas is not equal to zero. There are a couple of assumptions and conditions that need to hold for one factor ANOVA. We need to have independent random samples from each of our k populations. The dependent variable must be normally distributed within each individual group. And whenever we look at the variance of the dependent variable across each of our groups, it should be the same or roughly the same. The rule of thumb that we can use in order to determine if the variance is equal across the board is by looking at the ratio of the largest sample variance to the smallest sample variance. If the ratio of the largest sample variance to the smallest sample variance is less than two, then we're generally pretty comfortable in saying that we have equal variance across all of our groups that we're comparing. So let's set up our hypotheses for our final exam example. The first way that we can state the hypotheses is through the means. So our null hypothesis would be that the average final exam score in section one equals the average final exam score in section two, 
which is equal to the mean from section 3, which equals the mean from section 4. The alternative here would be that at least two of these mean final exam scores are not equal to one another. The second way that we can state the hypothesis is through the regression model. The null hypothesis would be that all of our alphas, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3, are simultaneously equal to zero. And the alternative would be that at least one of these three alphas is not equal to zero. Let's start out by taking a look at the data. Notice that we have 10 observations from each of our four different sections. The third column contains the 10 individual observations from each section. The fourth column contains the sample mean final exam score for each section. So section one averaged the highest in our sample out of the four sections at 87.1, whereas the fourth section scored the worst on average at 73.4. The next column over contains the sample standard deviation for the 10 observations within each group. And then the last two columns contain the skewness and the kurtosis, which we can use to assess normality. The first thing that we want to do is calculate out the regression equation. Now we're going to have four different regression parameters that we need to estimate. The first one that we can estimate is alpha not hat. Alpha not hat, which is again replacing the intercept that we typically see in multiple regression, is always going to be equal to the sample mean of the reference group. We're using section four as the reference group here, so alpha not hat is just going to be equal to the sample mean from section 4, which is 73.4. Each of the other three regression coefficients can be calculated by taking the difference between the sample mean for the group and the sample mean for the reference group. So alpha 1 hat, which corresponds to section 1, is going to be calculated by taking the sample mean final exam score for section 1, 87.1, and subtracting off the sample mean final exam score for the reference group, which is section 4, who had a sample mean of 73.4. This tells us that alpha 1 hat is going to be 13.7. Then we do the same thing for section 2. Alpha 2 hat is going to be the difference between y2 bar and y4 bar, 84.9, minus 73.4 gives us 11.5. And alpha 3 hat is going to be 81, the sample mean from section 3, minus 73.4, giving us 7.6. So in the end, our regression equation is y hat equal to 73.4 plus 13.7 times z1 plus 11.5 times z2 plus 7.6 times Z3. The next thing we should do is make sure the conditions are satisfied. First of all, let's check the independence condition. Because every single student here was sampled from one of four different sections, and no student was going to be enrolled in more than one of these sections, the observations are independent random samples. Second, we need to check for normality. Looking at the box plots over on the right, it appears as if they're all relatively close to being symmetric. If we take a look back at the skewness and the kurtosis from the previous slide, all of the values of the skewness were between negative 0.5 and positive 0.5. All of the values for the kurtosis were between negative 2 and positive 2. So that tells us that our dependent variable exam score is approximately normal in each of our individual sections. Finally, we need to check the equal variance condition. In order to check the equal variance condition, we take the largest sample variance, which is 5.98 squared, and divide by the smallest sample variance, which is 4.5 squared. That gives us 35.76 divided by 20.25. That ratio of the largest sample variance to the smallest sample variance is 1.77, which is less than 2. That tells us that the variance is about equal across all of our groups, so the equal variance condition is satisfied, meaning that we have all of the conditions that we need 
in order to run a one-factor ANOVA. Let's go into the calculation of the test statistic now. The test stat is calculated through two different sources of variability. Between group variation is looking to measure how different the sample means are from one another. It's denoted by SST, and it's calculated by weighting the squared difference that each sample mean is from the grand mean based on the sample size. Each group is going to make a contribution to the between group variation, and the farther the sample mean is from the grand mean, the larger the contribution. Each term is going to take the sample mean for the group, yi bar, subtract off the grand mean, y double bar, square the difference, and then multiply by the sample size. The sum of all of these contributions is going to give us the between group variation. The within group variation is looking to measure how different the observations are within each individual sample. This is the SSE in one factor ANOVA. Just like the between group variation, each group makes a contribution to the SSE, and each term is calculated by taking the sample size minus one and multiplying by the sample variance for the group. The sum of each of these terms gives us the SSE. The test statistic is the ratio of these sources of variability. It follows an F distribution, and it's calculated by taking the MST, the mean squared treatment, and dividing by the MSE, the mean squared error. The MST is equal to the SST divided by K minus 1, where K is the number of groups being compared, and the MSE is equal to the SSE divided by N minus K. This test statistic has k minus 1 degrees of freedom in the numerator and n minus k degrees of freedom in the denominator. Let's calculate out our two different sources of variability. Now recall from a couple of slides ago whenever we first looked at the data that we had 40 observations. If we average all 40 of those observations from a couple of slides ago, we get a mean of 81.6. This is going to be y double bar which is our grand mean. First, let's take a look at the between group variation, our SST. Each of our individual sections is going to make a contribution to the SST. The first class had a sample mean of 87.1, so we take their average, subtract off the grand mean of 81.6, square that difference, and then multiply by the sample size of 10, to get our contribution of 302.5 to the SST. Then we do the same thing for the second class. They averaged 84.9 on the final exam. We subtract off the grand mean of 81.6, square that difference, multiply by 10, and find that the second class is going to contribute 108.9 to the SST. The third class had a sample mean that was actually very close to the grand mean, so we have 81 minus 81.6, that difference squared, times 10, which gives us a very small contribution to the SST of 3.6. And then finally, the fourth class had a sample mean that was very far away from the grand mean. We have 73.4 minus 81.6, that difference squared, times the sample size of 10 from that class, giving us a contribution of 672.4. Adding up all of these different contributions together gives us an SST of 1087.4. Now if we instead look at the within group variation, we're going to take the sample variance for each of our groups and multiply it by the corresponding sample size minus 1. So for the first class, they had a sample standard deviation of 5. Squaring that gives us our sample variance. We then multiply that by the sample size minus 1 to get 225. The second class had a sample standard deviation of 4.58. So we'll take 10 minus 1 times 4.58 squared to get 188.79. The third class had a sample standard deviation of 4.5, so we have 9 times 4.5 squared, which gives us 
And for the fourth class, they had the largest sample standard deviation of 5.96. So we have 10 minus 1 times 5.98 squared, which is going to give us 321.84. Adding up all four of these terms gives us an SSE of 917.88. Now what we can do is calculate out the test statistic. The test statistic is going to be a ratio of the between group variation to the within group variation. So we're going to take the sums of squares due to the treatment, the between group variation of 1087.4 and divide it by its degrees of freedom, four minus one. Then we'll take the SSE of 917.88 divided by its degrees of freedom, the total number of observations, which is 40, minus the number of groups that we're comparing, which is 4. The ratio of these two terms is going to give us our test stat. So we have 362.47 as the MST. We have 25.5 as the MSE giving us a final test statistic of 14.21. The only thing left to do now is to finish off the test. The critical value here is going to be 2.87. This critical value is going to come from an F distribution with three degrees of freedom in the numerator and 36 degrees of freedom in the denominator. The corresponding p-value is three times 10 to the negative sixth power. So what we're able to say here is that we're going to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that at least two of these classes have significantly different mean final exam scores. Now the drawback that we're actually going to run into with one factor ANOVA is the fact that it's only going to reveal if a significant difference exists between at least two of the means. The problem is that it doesn't reveal how many pairs of means are significantly different or which pairs of means are significantly different. It only tells us whether or not a difference exists. So our solution to this is to use multiple comparisons. Multiple comparisons is a procedure that we use in order to determine exactly which pairs of means are significantly different in a one-factor ANOVA. You can think of multiple comparisons as an extension of ANOVA, what we do is we calculate a confidence interval for each pair of means, but unlike a typical difference of two means confidence interval, what we do is we make an adjustment to this interval based on how many comparisons need to be made. Now there are a lot of different multiple comparisons techniques out there. We have the Bonferroni adjustment method, we have the tukey kramer method, and we have Chaffee's method of multiple comparisons, each of which we're going to cover in the remaining part of this video. The Bonferroni adjustment method is the most conservative method of multiple comparisons that's used whenever pairwise comparisons of the population means are of primary interest. In the Bonferroni adjustment method, the significance level gets adjusted according to the number of comparisons that need to be made. So if our original overall significance level is alpha, and we need to make L comparisons, then what we do is we use a confidence level of 1 minus alpha over L for each of our confidence intervals to ensure that the overall level of significance is no larger than our original level of significance alpha. For the Bonferroni adjustment method, each confidence interval is calculated by taking the difference between the two sample means that we're looking to compare, yi bar minus yj bar, and then adding and subtracting the margin of error. Now, the margin of error looks a little bit different than your typical difference of two means confidence interval. The critical value is going to follow a t distribution with n minus k degrees of freedom, where n represents the total number of observations in your original data, and k represents the total number of categories that you compared originally. The confidence level is now going to be 1 minus alpha over 2L. And then the standard error is going to be the square root of the MSE from the ANOVA times 1 over the sample size from the first group plus 1 over the sample size from the second group. I also want to point out that the margin of error is going to be the same for every single one of your confidence intervals, 
if all of your sample sizes are the same. However, if you have different sample sizes in some of your groups, you're going to have to calculate out a different margin of error for those groups that have different sample sizes. Going back to our example, we're comparing the mean final exam scores of four statistics classes based on a random sample of 10 students from each class. We already know, based on the results of the one-factor ANOVA, that at least two of these means are significantly different from one another. Now our goal is to figure out specifically which means are different. Now our overall confidence level that we want to maintain is 95%, meaning that we're going to be using alpha equal to 0 0.05. We need to make a total of six comparisons. We need to compare section 1 against sections 2, 3, and 4. We need to compare section 2 against sections 3 and 4. And then we need to compare sections 3 and 4 against one another, giving us a total of six comparisons. The mean squared error from the ANOVA table was 25.5. And the next thing that we need to do is find the critical value. The critical value is going to follow a t-distribution with 36 degrees of freedom, 40 observations altogether, minus the four groups that we compared is where we get the 36 from. The confidence level is a little bit more challenging to calculate out. Instead of just doing a 95% confidence interval for every single one of these, we have to increase that level of confidence. Our confidence level is now going to be 1 minus alpha divided by 2 times the number of comparisons, or 1 minus 0 0.05 divided by 12. That means that every single one of our confidence intervals is going to be a 99.585% confidence interval. Now, no table is actually going to have this exact value on it, so you are going to have to rely on software in order to find these critical values using the Bonferroni adjustment method. But looking up this value using some kind of software gives us 2.79. The final thing that we need to do before actually calculating out the intervals is find the margin of error. We have our critical value, 2.79, times the square root of 25.5, times the quantity 1 over 10 plus 1 over 10. This gives us a margin of error of 6.3. Now again, keep in mind that all of our sample sizes were the same. We sampled 10 students from each of the four classes, so this margin of error is going to be the same for every single one of our six confidence intervals. At this point, it's a matter of calculating out each of our six confidence intervals. Down in the bottom right, we have a table containing the sample means from each of the four different sections. So to start things off, we'll take a look at the confidence interval comparing section 1 against section 2. We take the sample mean from section 1, 87.1, minus the sample mean from section 2, 84.9, add and subtract 6.3 from that difference, giving us a confidence interval of negative 4.1 up to positive 8.5. For comparing sections 1 and 3, we do the same thing. Sample mean for section 1 of 87.1 minus the sample mean from section 3, which was 81, plus and minus the margin of error, giving us a lower bound of negative 0.2 and an upper bound of 12.4. Then we'll compare sections 1 and 4. We have 87.1 minus the sample mean from section 4 of 73.4 plus and minus the margin of error of 6.3, giving us a lower bound of 7.4 and an upper bound of 20. Now we can start to look at the confidence intervals that do not involve section 1. Comparing sections 2 and 3, we have 84.9 minus 81, plus and minus the margin of error, giving us a lower bound of negative 2.4 and an upper bound of 10.2. Comparing sections 2 and 4, the interval centered at 84.9 minus 73.4, add and subtract 6.3. So our final confidence interval here is 5.2 up to 17.8. And then finally, we'll compare sections 3 and 4. 81 was the sample mean for section 3. Subtract off the sample mean for section 4 of 73.4, add and subtract the margin of error, giving us a confidence interval of 1.3 up to 13.9. In order to figure out 
which mean scores are significantly different from one another, we're looking for confidence intervals that do not contain zero. And in this case, there are three confidence intervals that do not contain zero. Comparing sections one and four, two and four, and three and four, we see that every single one of these confidence intervals was positive, telling us that sections one, two, and three all scored significantly better than section four on the final exam. Looking at the other three confidence intervals, there was not a significant difference between one and two, one and three, or two and three, because all of those confidence intervals contain both positive and negative values. Zero was a plausible value in all three of those cases. Let's take a look at the Tukey-Kramer method of multiple comparisons now. The Tukey-Kramer method is used whenever we're primarily interested in making pairwise comparisons of our population means, and we're potentially interested in analyzing every single combination. What makes the Tukey-Kramer method different from Bonferroni is the distribution of the critical value. Instead of using the t-distribution, the Tukey-Kramer method uses the studentized range distribution, which is denoted by q. Now, much like the f-distribution, the studentized range distribution has two parameters for the degrees of freedom. For calculating Tukey-Kramer confidence intervals, the numerator degrees of freedom is equal to k, and the denominator degrees of freedom is equal to m minus k. The percentile that's used is equal to 1 minus alpha. So if we want a 95% confidence interval, we use the 95th percentile. The confidence interval is then calculated much in the same way that the Bonferroni intervals were calculated. We center the interval at the difference between the sample means that we're comparing, add and subtract the critical value from the studentized range distribution, divided by the square root of 2, and then multiply by the same standard error from Bonferroni, the MSE from the ANOVA test times the quantity 1 over the first sample size plus 1 over the second sample size, that entire thing underneath the radical. Let's start to calculate out the Tukey-Kramer confidence intervals to determine which mean scores are significantly different. The first thing that we need is the mean squared error from the ANOVA test, the MSE there was 25.5. The next thing that we need is the critical value from the studentized range distribution. Now, most software packages are not actually going to have an option for finding percentiles of the studentized range distribution, so we need to rely on tables in order to find that value. What you see here is part of a studentized range distribution table. Up along the top, we have the numerator degrees of freedom, denoted by k, and running along the first column, we have the denominator degrees of freedom, n minus k. This table, we're going to use the third column, but notice we don't have quite enough degrees of freedom in the denominator, so going a little bit farther down in the table, we can match up the four degrees of freedom in the numerator with the 36 degrees of freedom in the denominator, to find that our critical value from the studentized range distribution is going to be 3.809. So we'll denote this value by q sub 4, comma 36, comma 0 0.05, telling us that this is the 95th percentile of the studentized range distribution that has 4 and 36 degrees of freedom. Now we have everything that we need in order to calculate out the margin of error. Out in front, we have the value from the studentized range distribution, 3.809, divided by the square root of 2. Then we multiply that by the same standard error that we had from Bonferroni, the square root of 25.5 times the quantity 1 over 10 plus 1 over 10, which is going to give us 6.08. Again, just like what happened in Bonferroni, because all of our sample sizes are the same, we're going to have the exact same margin of error for every single confidence interval that we calculate out. Notice also that this margin of error is slightly smaller than the 6.3 that we calculated out for Bonferroni. So let's do the same thing for Tukey Kramer that we did with Bonferroni. Comparing sections 1 and 2, we again have the difference between their sample means, 87.1 minus 84.9, plus and minus our new margin of error of 
giving us a lower bound of negative 3.88 and an upper bound of 8.28. Comparing sections 1 and 3, we have 87.1 minus 81 plus and minus 6.08, giving us a lower bound of 0 0.02 and an upper bound of 12.18. Comparing sections 1 and 4, we have 87.1 minus 73.4 plus and minus the margin of error of 6.08 giving us a confidence interval of 7.62 up to 19.78. For sections 2 and 3, we have 84.9 minus 81, plus and minus our margin of error for a lower bound of negative 2.18 and an upper bound of 9.98. Comparing sections 2 and 4, 84.9 minus 73.4, plus and minus the 6.08, for a lower bound of 5.42 and an upper bound of 17.58. And finally, comparing sections 3 and 4, we have 81 minus 73.4 plus and minus the margin of error, giving us a lower bound of 1.52 and an upper bound of 13.68. Now taking a look at these confidence intervals, we can again do the exact same thing and search to see if zero is contained in these confidence intervals. Anytime zero is not in the confidence interval, that's an indication that we have a significant difference. In this case, we actually have four pairs of beans that are significantly different. Sections one, two, and three all differ from section four. And this time with the Tukey Kramer method, we also find that sections one and three have significantly different final exam scores. In the end, Bonferroni and Tukey Kramer are very similar to one another, but there are a few differences. Bonferroni confidence intervals will have a slightly larger margin of error, making each confidence interval slightly wider than the corresponding Tukey Kramer interval. This results from the T statistic always being larger than the corresponding studentized range statistic that gets divided by the square root of 2. The Bonferroni adjustment method has a higher chance of making a type 2 error or concluding that no significant difference exists when in fact there is a significant difference in the means. On the other hand, the Tukey-Kramer method has a higher chance of making a type 1 error or concluding that a significant difference does exist between some pair of means when in reality there is no significant difference. And finally, like we just saw, we may end up coming to different conclusions at times. Bonferroni told us that there was no significant difference between the final exam scores of sections 1 and 3 because the interval contained 0. However, because Tukey Kramer is always going to give you a narrower interval, we did end up finding a significant difference between those two sections. Finally, let's take a look at Chaffee's method of multiple comparisons. Chaffee's method is used whenever we're interested in a comparison that's more complex than a simple pairwise difference between means, allowing us to incorporate more than two means at once. It's common to use Chaffee's method when you don't have these comparisons planned out ahead of time and you notice patterns in the data. So Chaffee's method is often used in post hoc analyses. Now, bear with me through the notation that you're about to see. Chaffee's method is much easier to understand once you see a concrete example. What we do is define a contrast by assigning some weight, C sub i, to each group such that the sum of the weights is equal to zero. We then test the null hypothesis that the sum of the weighted means is equal to zero against the alternative hypothesis that the sum of the weighted means is not equal to zero. These hypotheses are tested by calculating out a confidence interval. The interval gets centered at the sum of the weighted sample means. Then we add and subtract the margin of error. Out in front, we have the square root of k minus 1 times the f statistic that has k minus 1 degrees of freedom in the numerator and n minus k degrees of freedom in the denominator. The percentile of this statistic is going to match the level of confidence that we want in the interval. Then we multiply that by the square root of the MSE times the sum of each weight squared divided by the corresponding sample size for the group. In the end, 
will conclude that a significant difference exists if the confidence interval does not contain zero. Let's suppose that sections 1 and 4 met on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and that sections 2 and 3 met on Tuesday and Thursday. We want to know if there's a significant difference in the mean scores for the Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes compared to the Tuesday, Thursday classes. Now, the first thing that we need to do for Chaffee's method is set up a contrast. We're going to combine the students from sections 1 and 4, and also combine the students from sections 2 and 3. So really, we're asking, is the average final exam score for sections 1 and 4 equal to the average for sections 2 and 3? Or alternatively, is the average for sections 1 and 4 minus the average for sections 2 and 3 equal to 0? Splitting up each term, we get 1 half mu 1 minus 1 half mu 2 minus 1 half mu 3 plus 1 half mu 4 set equal to 0. Notice that the sum of the weights is also equal to 0 here. Now we can start calculating out the confidence interval. Out in front, we have the sum of the sample means for sections 1 and 4, 87.1 plus 73.4, divided by 2. Then we subtract the sum of the sample means for sections 2 and 3, 84.9 plus 81, divided by 2. Now we can calculate out the margin of error. The first part is the square root of 4 minus 1, because we have four groups times the critical value from the F distribution with 3 and 36 degrees of freedom, which turns out to be 2.87. Then we multiply by the following term. Under the radical, we first have the MSE, 25.5. Then we incorporate the weight and sample size for each group in the contrast. Sections 1 and 4 had weights of 1 half assigned to them, so we have 1 half squared in each of their numerators. Sections 2 and 3 had weights of negative 1 half, so we have negative 1 half squared in each of their numerators. Each of the squared weights is then divided by the sample size of 10 that we have in each group. This gives us 80.25 minus 82.95 out in front. Then we add and subtract the square root of 8.61 times the square root of 2.55. Our final confidence interval is going to range from negative 7.39 up to positive 4.69. So to answer the question of whether the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday, Thursday sections had significantly different final exam scores, we see that this confidence interval contains a zero, so there's no significant difference between the average final exam scores for students on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday compared to the average for students on Tuesday and Thursday. Now let's see what happens if the weights are not all equal to one half. Let's suppose that sections one, two, and three were all taught by the same instructor, but that section four was taught by a different instructor. We want to determine if the sections taught by the two instructors have significantly different means. Again, we'll start by creating a contrast, but this time the weights will be different. We're going to combine the students from sections one, two, and three together, and section four will stand on its own. So here we're asking, is the average final exam score for students in sections one, two, and three equal to the average for section four? Or alternatively, is the difference between the mean for these three sections minus the mean for section four equal to zero? Expanding the contrast, we get one third times mu one plus one third times mu two plus one third times mu three minus mu four equal to zero. Notice again that all of our weights still sum to zero. Now our confidence interval is going to be centered at the average of the first three sections, 87.1 plus 84.9 plus 81 divided by three minus the mean of section four because section four has a weight of negative one. Then we add and subtract the margin of error. Because the number of groups and the number of observations didn't change, we still have the square root of 3 times 2.87 underneath the first radical. Under the second radical, 
we still have the same MSE, 25.5. However, the second term under the radical is different because the weights are different. Each of the first three sections has a weight of one-third. So we have one-third squared in the numerator divided by 10 three different times. Then we add on the term for section four. That section was assigned a weight of negative one, so we have negative one squared divided by 10. The first three sections averaged 84.33 on the final exam, so the confidence interval is centered at 84.33 minus 73.4. Then we're going to add and subtract the margin of error, which is the square root of 8.61 times the square root of 3.4. This gives us a final confidence interval of 5.52 up to 16.34. Now in this case, because the entire confidence interval is positive, we can say that there is a significant difference in the means of the first three sections compared to the fourth section. Because the entire interval is positive, we can also say that students who had the instructor who taught three sections scored significantly better compared to the students whose instructor taught only the one section. So to finish things off, let's take a look at the similarities and the differences between these two Chaffee confidence intervals. The main similarity was that the critical value and the MSE stayed the same regardless of the contrast that we set up. In terms of the differences, the main difference was that the contrast that had equal weights had a smaller margin of error. So the takeaway here is for the same sample, the margin of error is dependent upon the weights that are assigned to each group in the contrast.